the Word of God. Starting verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and the Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who, are, who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's pray. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. As our pastor, Lord, preaches your word to us, Father, I pray that our hearts would be good soil. We look forward to the harvest that you would bring to us, Lord, through your word. The Lord, that you would knit us together as one body. Um, that we'd worship you in spirit and truth um, through the whole service and through your word. Um, bless George as he brings your word. Lord, speak to us. Um, grow us, Father, as a people to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Today I want to answer the question, who is God? Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am in the Gospels? And the disciples tried to come up with some philosophical answer. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah. In other words, God, Christ had come in the spirit of those men. So Christ cut to the chase and he looked right at them and he said, who do you say that I am? It's a question we all have to come to terms with, come to grips with. I want to look more broadly at that question and answer, who do we say that God is? And so last week we began our study in the book of Revelation and what we saw was God was, is commissioning a message to his church. God the Father initiates it to the Son. The Son gives it to an angel. The angel gives it to John. John to the seven churches. And then we get it. And last week as we saw that, we saw that what is being communicated is there's more than meets the eye. This is revelation, a revealing. There's something going on behind the scenes. We saw that God is indeed in control of it. And the whole point is that the time is near. These things must soon take place. We looked at that last week. He said we should be happy about this. It's the word, the word blessed means. Blessed is the one who reads the words of these book, as we just have done, and who hears the words and who does the words. Well, this week, the letter actually starts. Because this is a letter. It's an epistle, which means it's a letter. It's a letter from John. That's the way the text starts. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. When you get a letter in the mail, if you still get letters in the mail... What, what's the first thing you do? If you're like me, you look at who sent it, the return address, maybe even sort it out. One piles for all the credit card ad advertisements and the bills, and you probably focus in on the ones that look like checks, or that came from people you love. Well, they're, they're getting a scroll. And so they unroll the scroll, and it's a very long scroll. 22 chapters in our Bible. So the, the book begins with who this is from, John. It says it's to the seven churches. We're going to be looking at the individual seven churches in the weeks to come. But what we should say now is this number seven, if you don't know, is very significant in the book of Revelation. It doesn't always mean a literal seven. Just consider all the things that the book of Revelation uses the number seven for. There are seven churches, seven spirits, seven bowls, seven stars, seven seals, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven heads, seven diadems. There are seven plagues, seven lampstands, seven mountains. Number seven is very significant in the book of Revelation. It stands for completeness or wholeness. 
something is whole, it is perfect. It stands for perfection. And so here, this letter to the seven churches that are in Asia Minor, we actually know there were more than seven churches there. Colossae was there. So why only seven? Well, this is to the whole church, to the complete church. And Christ picks seven of the churches to address directly. But in that, it is to all of us, to the whole church. The letter goes on. It says, grace and peace. A common greeting we find in our scriptures, grace and peace. Grace, a common Greek greeting, charis. Peace, a common Hebrew greeting. The Hebrews would say shalom. And so here, into to the Greek world, the Greek-speaking world, grace and these Christians drawing on their Jewish faith, peace, grace, and peace, should sound familiar to you because Paul uses this greeting all the time, but, but what usually comes next is from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we get a much longer sort of description of who this grace and peace are from. Perhaps the greatest description and the fullest description in one small place in such short words of who God is. And that's why I want us to consider who is God. I think we small humans forget who God is or fail to recognize him in truth. And I mean, we avoid time with God in prayer or in his word or in meeting with his body. Other things get in the way of of that. and We put these little G gods in place of the big and holy God that we worship. So today we want to look at this big God, see who he is. I have up on your screen the title of the sermon, Who Do You Say God Is? in three points. Who is the Lord? What has he done? And is he doing? And what is he telling us here? Usually I have that in your bulletin this week. I don't, and I think the title is wrong in your bulletin. So that's what it is. I do have some slides this week. That's why the screen is down. And let me see. Make sure I can operate them. I do. Okay. So who is the Lord? It's an interesting question. We're studying uh, the book of Exodus on Wednesday nights here. And we're, we're, we're coming up to a great sort of showdown, an epic battle that we will see is not very epic at all. But Moses is finally going to go to Pharaoh and give, the, give Pharaoh that famous words, let my people go, from the Lord. Pharaoh's response is telling, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. This is not a statement of ignorance. This is a statement of indignation. Pharaoh's a god, little g god. That's what the Egyptians considered Pharaoh. The idea that a rival God would make a claim on Pharaoh's people is repulsive to Pharaoh. And so the Lord is going to show Pharaoh who the Lord is. Ten plagues come upon Egypt. Pharaoh's firstborn son is killed. The children of Israel are delivered on dry ground through the Red Sea, and the Egyptian armies are buried in that same sea. I think it's safe to say that the Pharaoh figured out who the Lord was. It's at this point that Moses would sing a song, drawing on Pharaoh's words, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders, who is like you? That was way back in Exodus, and the Bible then gives progressive revelation to the God's people of who God is. Here we are at the end of the Bible, the last book of the canon of Scripture. So this is God's last opportunity to reveal to his people who he is. And that's what we see. And the first thing that we see, or actually, let me take a step back. What we see is God is telling us he is Trinity. may surprise you to know that the word Trinity is never in the Scripture, but the concept is taught. And let's look at who God is. First, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Speaks of God's transcendence over time. Last week we saw God telling us the time is short. These things will soon happen. And here God puts himself out there as transcending time. 
the God who is, literally the God being, reminds us again of the Exodus where God says to tell his people that I am sent you. If you're English teachers here, if you remember elementary school or middle school English, the verb to be, I remember a few of them, am, is, are, was, were, be, being, been, maybe that sounds familiar. It's not a verb of action. It's a verb of being, of existence. God is, does not change. We'd expect it to say the God who is, who was, and who shall be. That would follow the kind of pattern of what he's saying. But instead he says, and is to come. Again, drawing on this idea that the time is short and things are going to happen and he wants us to realize that. And the idea that this God who is to come is a marrying of the God who is. The God who is, the God who is transcendent is also eminent in that he is coming. This God who transcends space and time is near. The book of Daniel calls him the Ancient of Days. In verse 8, we see he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Alpha being the first letter of the Greek alphabet, Omega being the last. Isn't it interesting? It's more than just the beginning of the, and the end, but if he is the entire alphabet, everything about God is contained in the letters of the alphabet, right? I mean, you, could, you make language, and language is very important. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God teaches us in words and in language. So grace and peace from the Father... Next, we have grace and peace from the Holy Spirit. This is very complicated, I get it. I'm going to hope to kind of unpack it from you because it says grace and peace and from the seven spirits who are before the throne, his throne. It's complicated. What does that mean? Is there seven Holy Spirits? Are these angels? Are they the spirits of men? Well, the book of Revelation has the word spirits in it over 20 times. In the book of Revelation, it never refers to angels. It can refer to demons, which are fallen angels. So evil spirits are referred to. Clearly, this is not from an evil spirit. It is also not the spirits of men. This is God. God is spirit. It says seven. Again, Seven drawing on the idea that I mentioned before. All the sevens in Scripture, completeness or wholeness. This Holy Spirit is complete. He's whole. But there's also more going on there. And in Zechariah chapter 4, an Old Testament book, Zechariah gets a vision. Let me read some of it to you. I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it, and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. He goes on, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked to me answered, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by my, my, excuse me, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, will these things happen? Then he goes on to say, these are the seven, these seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through all the earth. So the Holy Spirit is, is described as a lampstand with seven lamps or seven eyes. And what, what does light do but illuminates? And what do eyes do but seek and know? The Holy Spirit is all-knowing and all-powerful in that. In the book of Isaiah, in chapter 11, it says this, And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Seven sort of descriptors for the Spirit. As a matter of fact, in chapter 4, the Holy Spirit is described as the seven spirits before the throne of God. And in chapter 5, he's described as the seven eyes. If you put all this together, you have a complete and perfect knowledge and light going out into the world that is God and into our hearts. And the sevenfold characteristics of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the agent of the Godhead that is knowing and seeking and searching and applying and empowering and helping and counseling. This is the Holy Spirit. I know we have less of a hard time understanding who the Father is and we certainly understand who the Son is, but the Spirit becomes vague to us. But as you start to unpack this, you see that He is the active agent in all of this. Same way He illuminates and searches out what's going on in the world, does He not do that in our own hearts? 
Same way he was hovering over the waters of the chaos of creation and then God speaks into it and brings about order. Does he not do that in our own hearts, in the chaos of our hearts and illuminates us to the light of Christ and we come to faith? So Father, Spirit, Son, and from Jesus Christ. And we know that's the Son. And later in our text, it'll call God his Father. He's the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And what's neat about this is, have you ever heard of the threefold office of Christ? He's the prophet, the priest, and the king. As the faithful witness that we talked about last week, and we see again, we're going to see in the future in Revelation, he is a prophet. This is prophecy that he is witness to. He is the firstborn of the dead. That's a little more complicated. How does that make him a priest? Well, first of all, this idea of firstborn does not mean that he was created, like some uh, heresies say. It also does not mean that he was the first... uh, to die, certainly, is not to be the first to be rose from the dead. We have other resurrections in the scripture. Firstborn simply means preeminent and first. You get a double portion of the inheritance. You're the premier. The book of Hebrews chapter 1 says that he is the firstborn of creation. As you follow in Hebrews in chapter 1 and 2, it tells you that he had to become man so he could be a sympathetic high priest. It actually says he had to be made like his brothers. This firstborn had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. The firstborn gets the right to be the priest. He is the high, he is a priest. He's the high priest. And he is king, ruler of the kings of the earth. Revelation 17 and 18 says what? He is king of kings and lord of lords. Christ is clearly a king. Are you getting the idea of who this God is that we serve? Something else you should notice from these three persons of the Trinity is that each one is described in three parts. Again, God is using this text to kind of draw us to this. God is Trinity. Who is the Lord? Who is like the Lord? Father, Spirit, Son. Father as ever being. Spirit as ever seeing. The Son as ever doing. Isn't that what his ministry is? He lives always to intercede for us. Making intercession for us. I know we have difficulty grasping the Trinity. It's complicated. We have to live in that tension that God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Jesus Christ says, I and the Father are one. There is not multiple gods, there is one God, and yet there are three persons in one God. If we could understand this, God would be very simple. We are finite human beings. We can't understand all these things. But we can accept them. I ask you to reject all illustrations you have in your mind of what the Trinity is. Every single one of them. God is not like water. You may have used that before, seen that used before. God is not H2O. He is not liquid, solid gas. That's that's a heresy known as modalism. Liquid can become gas. It can evaporate. Liquid can become solid. We can make ice. The Father does not become the Son. The Son does not become the Spirit. He does not uh, shape shift or change forms. He exists eternally, Father, Spirit, Son. Hold it in tension. Each has a personality, each has a role. We're going to see them all together in chapter 5. In creation, the Father speaks. The Son is, is said that he was with God at creation. In fact, the Son, it says, has created all things. And then we learn that the Son is what? But the spoken word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So the Father speaks, the Son is the Word, the Spirit is hovering over the waters, applying the Word. In Christ's baptism, Jesus Christ is standing there, the Spirit descends upon him as a dove, and the Father says those great words, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Father, Spirit, Son. In your salvation, I've already said it, but the Father sends the Son, the Son dies for you, and the Spirit applies that work to your life, illuminating your heart to that. All three 
together. One God, three persons. Hold it in tension. You know what the greatest anecdotal proof of this is? I believe the Trinity is the answer to this philosophical question that people like to ask. This idea that we, we know there has to be a God. I mean, Romans 1 tells us that, and, and the Bible is clear. I mean, you know, if there's anything here, it had to be created because you can't have an endless regression, and whatever created this has to be outside of space and time. Can't be a part of it. But what is it? What was God doing before he created? What was he doing? Was he lonely? If you may have heard that. The Trinity is the answer to this. God existed in all eternity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons in relationship. Tim Keller says it's, it's like a dynamic dance for all eternity, a pulsating energy and love that we have in the Trinity. And then out of an overflow of that, out of an ex, as an expression of it, he creates. And what does he create? Relational beings. How do you get relational beings from a non-relational God? You wouldn't. God is a relationship. Father, Spirit, Son. We are created as relational beings. He is outside of space and time. He is sovereign over it. He is infinite, unchanging, ever existent, ever present, ever knowing, ever powerful, ever doing. And he loves you. Do you know this God? We move then to Christ. So we have Father, Spirit, Son given here. There's a reason that this order is given that way instead of the normal Father, Son, Spirit. Because now the Son is going to be explained as a doxology begins. To Him. To who? Well, to Christ. It says, who loves us and has freed us and made us. Again, another set of three. You see how God is continually in this section... Uh, communicating in groups of three things to try to communicate perhaps that he is Trinity. We know he is Trinity, but probably that's why he's communicating this way. He loves us, Christ does. He has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom and pr of priests to God and his Father, to his God and Father. Again, as I said, this God who is infinite, unchanging, ever exists. So all the omnis, right? Omnipresent, omni, um, omnipotent, omniscient. He loves us. That's what it says here. Who loves us? Actually, our text kind of puts it in the past tense. Maybe it says who loved us or who loves us, but it's, it's who is loving us. It's written in the present tense like that. Who is loving us? And the next one says, and is freeing us from our sins by his blood. Why is that? Well, certainly at the cross, our sins have been forgiven, past, present, future. But why does it say he is freeing us? I think it is drawing us into, again, this God who is, who was, and who is to come. There is always a past, present, and, and future reality to the things that are being communicated. Romans 6, 7, and 8 follows this pattern. In Romans 6, it tells us how the Son has freed us by his blood on the cross, that we have been freed from our sins. Yet Romans 7 shows us that we might be saints, but we still sin. And so we are being freed, or we are, he is freeing us from those sins and our sanctification. And then Romans 8 shows us that one day we will be glorified with no sin, totally freed. So, so this past, present, future reality to him freeing us from our sins. And then it says, and made us, and that is made us, as, as in the past tense, a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, he is our high priest and we are priests in the priestly service of God. You're in the court of the kings, of the king. This next slide shows how in describing the son and who the grace and peace is from, in this doxology we have a, a, a pattern. So in from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and ruler of kings of the earth, to him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us a kingdom and priest forever. In other words, the faithful witness loves us. He is the firstborn of the, of the dead, thereby freeing us from our sins. He is ruler of kings of the earth, and he puts us in the kingdom. Do you see how these threes fit together? There's a pattern.
To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The doxology continues. What is doxology? Well, that word for glory is a Greek word that's doxa, which just means glory or to praise or to honor. The ology means to write down or to ascribe, to ascribe glory to the king. To him be glory and dominion, which is power, forever and ever, which is literally to the ages of the ages, forever. He's ever existent. He's going to get this praise forever and ever. As we consider this God, do we not want to do that? Are we not invited to do that? Notice how we are in this passage, in this doxology. Where are we? He loves us. He freed us. And he's made us into his people. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. It's an amazing God. It's like Moses said, there is no one like you, Lord. This God who is ever present and ever seeing and ever doing and Father, Son, and Spirit, he loves his people and he places us into his kingdom, out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. He gets all the praise because he is all powerful for our time. That is what that doxology says. He will not share his reign in your life with any of your little g gods. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I pray we are on the right side of that confession. Our text closes with what Revelation is moving forward and toward. Yes, worship, that's what this is showing. This is worship, but worship at what? But at the coming of Christ and the judgment of the King. That's what Revelation is moving toward. That's what this text is moving toward. It says... Again, another set of threes. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. I really considered just doing this section all next week because you see the verses of Scripture I put up there. All of these things are just piling uh, Old Testament illustrations and stuff from the life of Christ into one section. He is coming with the clouds as found in Daniel's prophecy. Behold, I saw one like the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Matthew's gospel says that, where Jesus says it himself. Mark's gospel says it. 1 Thessalonians 4 says it. As a matter of fact, let's, let's look at that. Um, and I don't know where it is in your pew Bible. I guess I'll read it to you from Thessalonians Some of you are going there. I'll give you a sec. First Th Thessalonians 4.13. Uh, actually, we'll go to 4.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will all be, always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, and then sudden destruction will come upon them. This was what we were saying last week, like that Titanic that set sail, peace and security. And when they hit that iceberg like that, it's going to come quickly. He's coming on the clouds like the song we sang said. There has been this idea lately that that's an idiom, meaning a Hebrew saying, again, of course, written in Greek, but this idea that Christ coming on the clouds means he's coming swiftly and quickly and unexpectedly. That's true. But he is also literally coming on the clouds. I direct you to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 9. We know that Christ died and was rose. He also ascended to heaven 40 days later. When he rose, he was on earth, showing he was rose. The disciples are meeting with him, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Angels always say 
the obvious. This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. I have to believe that while we don't understand it, Christ is returning on the clouds. He doesn't need the clouds, but he's coming on the clouds because he's in control of creation. And what cooler thing than that, by the way? As kids, don't we all want to walk on, on the air and clouds and he's going to do it again. You know, I, I know this sermon has been light on illustration and application. I know a lot of you told me you liked the Titanic illustration last week. But as I, as I set out to answer this question, who do you say God is? Who is God? And I, I, I'm getting into the text. I really want to preach this sermon for three or four weeks. Just digging into this stuff and let the words themselves show us who this God is. He's glorious. He is like no other. Do not believe when they say in... And in, in, in you hear in the world that we all pray to or worship the same God. A book was written by um, Protestant theologian Miroslav Volf. You may be familiar with him, maybe not. And he, he advanced this idea. He said, Allah, the Christian response, that Christians and, and Muslims actually worship the same God. We just understand him differently. Then this professor at Wheaton College, an evangelical Christian college, started teaching that. She was removed from her post. We do not worship the same God as the Muslims. We just understand him differently. The Bible speaks of other gods, little g gods. It says demonic forces are in charge of those belief systems. What it means is, I'm sorry to say, when those religions are worshiping something else, it's not like the prayers just go up this funnel and all kind of make it to God and he just ignores the incorrect assumptions to him. If not in and through Christ, it's like the line is cut. It goes somewhere else. You might think I'm being intolerant. You know what's intolerant? You know what's intolerant to Muslims? Saying they worship the same God as us. They are repulsed by that. It is insulting, not just to Christians. It's insulting to Muslims. Never tell a Muslim that. You want to insult them? They have a saying in the Quran that says God has no partners. The reason it says that is because it's refuting the Trinity. The Trinity is absurd to them. The idea that God came as a man, as our text is showing today, is, is grotesque to them. They have grotesque sayings about the idea that God would come as a man because of all the gross things that humans do. The idea is that, well, you fill in the blank, that God would do whatever. This is not what they believe. Yet this is the God we serve, this is the God we worship, this is the God that's being communicated to us. He is Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, ever-present, ever-knowing, ever working on our behalf because he loves us, our text says. Now I'm going to get real controversial on you. We do not worship the same God as the Jewish people. We do worship the same God as the Jewish scriptures describe. But when Jewish people are rejecting Christ and worshiping what they call Yahweh, they are not worshiping the same God as we are. Jesus Christ said this, folks. I direct you to John 10, John 8, John 1. In John 10, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now, there's people out there that say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, the Jewish people understood that he was claiming to be God. And he didn't tell them you're wrong. He repeatedly said things that put him on equal par with the Father. As a matter of fact, that ever-present name for God, tell the people, the Jewish people, I am sent you. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am John 10, 8, it says, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's. So these are Torah-keeping Jewish leaders. That he just said, your father is the devil. Who are they praying to? They praying to God? Jesus said, no, you're praying to the devil. Whoever is God, of God, hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. 
In John chapter 1, it says he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him he belie and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Which dispels another myth we hear in the world. We are all God's children. No, we're not. If you're not following Christ, Jesus says you're following who? Who gets to be a child of God? Those who believed in his name. This is the God we serve. In, in John's second letter, or in his first, uh, in his first letter, chapter 1, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. That means you have to believe that Jesus is a man. John is refuting the idea that Jesus was not a man. He came in the flesh, fully man, fully God. One more for you. 2 John 1. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have got out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. You want to know who the antichrist is? He just told us. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. That's what the scriptures say about who God is. Listen, folks, or should I say as our text, behold... It's the first imperative in our text. You know what imperative is? This is what you do. Do this. Everything else has been indicative, which means this is just the way it is. Now we're being told to look, to listen. It's an imperative. Behold what? He is coming with the clouds. Be aware. He's coming quickly, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Pay attention. That's what it's saying. Believe this. Last week, blessed or happy are those who read the words, hear the words, and do the words because of this. Look, folks, I know we said it last week. The time is near. These things must soon take place. And we said, what do you mean? It's been 2,000 years. And we looked at that last week. I encourage you to get that message. But I'll tell you what, whether Christ waits another 2,000 years or he comes in the next day or so, the time is short for us because we are a vapor. So for us, he's coming in less than 100 years because one day we're going to close our eyes and the next day he's there. So this text is saying, God is not slow. We just don't get it. He's coming with the clouds. That's his revealing. And then every eye will see him. This is the judgment. Even those who pierced him. There'll be weeping and wailing. Can you imagine? Those who cried out, crucify him. Pontius Pilate, who looked at Jesus and said, don't you know I have the authority over your life and death? And what does Christ tell him? You have no authority but that which is given to you. And here in our text, it shows us why. Because he is king of kings and lord of lords. Caiaphas, the high priest, they will all look at Christ, whom he, who pierced him. They pierced him. And those Roman soldiers who held the nails and hammered the nails will see Jesus, not naked and beaten and weak, in all his glory. Behold! That's what our Jesus is. We'll see him next week. You know... I tend to take this section really, particularly that last verse, the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him as, as the unbelievers could be referring. I mean, we all certainly will look at him. And I don't know what it's going to be like when I see him. But I probably will be crying. I don't know. But this wailing seems to in, imply regret. So it's easy to look at them, those who pierced him, and kind of blame them or look down on them. But I'm just drawn to Isaiah 53. Do you know Isaiah 53? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. 
And with his wounds, we are healed. Praise God. There is a sense by which we pierced him, but you know what? We're not guilty of that because our sins are forgiven. But there are people that are guilty of it. The guilt stays because they are not forgiven. This might be slow, but I believe our text is showing us two groups of people. Those in the kingdom of God, and it describes them as happy, loved, and forgiven. Happy, blessed last week, loved, and forgiven this week. And those in the city of men, not in the kingdom of God. We have been taken out of the kingdom of men, those tribes of the earth, and brought into a new nation. Those who are still in that old kingdom, when this happens, weeping and wailing, guilty. Which are you? When he returns, there are two categories. Or when souls leave this earth, either if we die first or if he comes first, just like Thessalonians says, there's going to be two categories of people, those in the kingdom and those who chose not to be in the kingdom. Us and them. Christ loves us, freed us, made us a nation. Are you in those people? Have you seen the beauty of Christ and the glory of God as we have in this text? We worship him. Why wouldn't we? Behold, listen, the time is near. See this wonderful God for who he is. Make his son your Lord and Savior by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.